Well, good morning, Moraine Valley Church. It's great to be together, and I'm so glad to see so many of you back this morning, even though there isn't a picnic. I say that because, you know, I used to uh, speak at the mission, the Pacific Garden Mission, when I was a student at Moody, and they would come and listen to you preach because they knew they were getting food afterwards. And so uh, I'm so glad you guys came. Even with no promise of food today, you still came here to worship the Lord. So we're so excited to be with you. How many of you remember the message a couple weeks ago on encouragement? You know, we talked about finding a firm foundation in Jesus. I want to thank so many of you that encouraged me last week about that picture that was for the second place team. As people come up and said, you know, Pat, you used to be so good looking. And I said, now, wait a minute, used to be. Somebody says, now I know why Kim married you. And I'm like, you know, is this encouragement? I'm just not really sure. But uh, God bless you. Love you guys anyhow by faith as I depend upon Jesus for that kind of love for you. Even though you encourage me like that. You know, this morning, I'm going to close the series that we've been doing better together. And we're going to close this series. This, amen. It has been, you know, I've been blessed as, as I've studied for it. And I'm going to close this series this morning with closing remarks that come from Paul's closing remarks to the church in Rome in the book of Romans. So turn to Romans 15 if you have your Bibles or on your phone, however you do that. And in this section, Romans 15, 14 on, Paul makes a transition as he's closing the book and he starts to talk to them about his ministry, both his current ministry and his future ministry. Then he talks to them with a number of greetings. As a matter of fact, last week, Pastor Gary took us through that section and what a wonderful message about greeting one another and using that as an example. But I gotta be honest with you, Gary, the message was awesome, I was blessed, but I was so impressed with your ability to pronounce those names. I was like, wow, did you guys catch that? I mean, he really did a great job. Believe me, if you ever wanna see names botched up, just call me up and ask me to do that for you. I can do that. But Gary, thanks for that message. And we're back in that same passage again this morning in Romans 15. And then after all these greetings, then he talks about, or actually finishes with a blessing that he makes upon the church in Rome. And he says to them at the start of this that, you know, I wrote to you guys very boldly because I have a special ministry to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And in the midst of this, he gives them a very high compliment. Now, I hope you're there at Romans 15. Let me read this to you. In verse 14, he says this, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able also to admonish one another. But I've written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God. Paul makes an amazing compliment here about convinced that they're filled with goodness, they're filled with knowledge. You're actually able to admonish one another. Listen to what R.C. Sproul says about this. As I was reading commentaries, this is what R.C. said. Paul does not give himself to idle compliments. You know, this is the inspired word of God, so he's not just blowing these guys up. This is a sincere compliment from the pen of the apostle, which tells us something about the community of Christians that was in Rome. This was an extraordinary church. Imagine a minister honestly being able to say to his congregation, I am sure that you are full of goodness, that you are filled with knowledge and that you are able to teach one another. Then he said this, this is what struck me. There are not many congregations that could hear that kind of honest evaluation and compliment. 
You know, I, that struck me because of this, because when I uh, decided to finish the series with this topic and I looked through, you know what I did? I got the concordance, got all the verses about admonishment that are there. The one that stuck out to me was the one here in Romans 15, 14, because this is the way I feel about Moraine Valley Church. <laughs> so I guess we are one of those churches and I'm one of those ministers that can honestly say to the people of Moraine Valley, I believe that you're full of goodness. And I believe that you have the knowledge to be able to admonish one another. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at this passage and learn a little bit about admonishment, just what that is and how we go about doing that. But you know, before I do it, I want to, I just let me read the same passage from the New Living Translation. I am fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness you know these things so well, you can teach each other all about them. Even so, I've been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that all you need is this reminder. You know, as I have preached in the series, as Craig has preached, as Mike and as Gary, we've spoken boldly about some things, but we did it in the spirit that we're convinced. Because it's a series about better together, living life together, because we're convinced that this is a body of people who are able to teach and admonish one another. So what is admonishment? That's not a word we use here in North America very often. It's not one we talk with each other about too often. But admonishment is used in two different ways in the New Testament. The Greek word basically means this, to put in mind. That means this, I'm going to say something to you to get it into your thinking. Admonishment is I'm going to speak into your life. I'm, I'm going to say something. I'm going to put something into your thoughts so you can think about it. That's what the word literally means. And it's used two different ways. To teach and to warn. Now those are basically uh, two sides of the same coin, by the way. It's teaching with a sense of warning. So admonishment has that idea. We learned earlier in the series that this word shows up along with teaching, teaching and admonishing. That's what Paul's ministry was in order to make us complete in Christ. In Colossians 1, we saw this a few weeks ago as we looked at this. And Paul said, we proclaim him, speaking of Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. Why? So we may present every man complete in Christ. You know what, guys? To be complete, we don't just need teaching. We need admonishment. We saw further on in the same book that that's not just the ministry that Paul had. That's the ministry we're to have to one another. As we're told to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So Paul's ministry was one of teaching and admonishing so that we could be complete in Christ. When we're filled with the word of God, our role is to teach and admonish each other with all wisdom. Vine's Dictionary uh, many of you use that as a tool. It basically defines synonyms in the scripture and helps you cut them a little bit tighter. He says teaching has to do with the positive truth. Admonishment has to do more with the wrong and the warning. And so teaching is that time when you come along and I'm just teaching you how to live and this is how you go and this is how you do it. Admonishment is when you're coming along and say, hey, you know what, something's out of line here. Something's not right. Something needs to be corrected. Something needs to be confronted. And so a balanced teaching of, of God's word, not only from Paul, the apostles, the ministers, the ministry, but from one another is both the positive teachings, how to walk with God, but the warnings and the admonishments when we're not doing it well. And that's what admonishment is. 
It's advising others about their life with a special emphasis with, hey guys, something's a little bit out of whack here that needs to be adjusted. Now when you look at Romans 15, 14, we see two qualities that go hand in hand with admonishment. Let me say this. If we go to a brother or sister whose life might be a little bit off and we don't do it with these two qualities, there's a good chance it won't be received well. And see if you can pick them up as I read this passage again in Romans 14. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. There's two qualities. They were to be filled with, not just to have a touch of, not just to have a taste of, but these qualities, if I'm going to go to somebody else's life and seek to correct them about their walk with Jesus, these are qualities that need to be controlling my life and filling my life and influencing my life, characterizing my life. So when you look at that person, you say, hey, that person's full of goodness and they're full of knowledge. So these aren't just, hey, I I know the definition of it or I know the Bible verses about it. It is so worked in your life that now your life is controlled and influenced by goodness and knowledge. So what's goodness? Again, goodness is a two-sided coin. One side is the positive, good, moral qualities The other side is the disposition that somebody else has good in their life. I want their best. Both both sides of the coin are important because, you know, goodness says I have a moral quality to my life that is Christ-like. Matter of fact, you realize that goodness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And so it's not just something that we get on a character program and change and say, you know, it becomes as we rely upon the Spirit of God who lives in us and he manifests his life through us, goodness becomes a part of our life. And so, you know, somebody that has goodness, one thing it shows is this. They somehow figured out how to walk with Jesus in such a way that it's actually coming out of their life. And so somebody who's going to come and correct you in your life is not going to be somebody who you want that shows nothing of reality of Christ in their life, but somebody that shows the goodness of Christ. And the other side of the coin is the idea that there is a disposition towards wanting good for you. So I'm not here to blast you because I'm out of patience because you bug me. You following me? (laughs) But out of goodness says, I'm concerned for you. I'm concerned for your life. I'm concerned about the direction you're taking. Do you realize long term where this is going to take you? And so the first quality that goes hand in hand with admonishment is a sense of goodness. Their life is living it and they have a concern for your best. But the second quality in this passage is this. Look back at the text, Romans 15, 14. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and are able also to admonish one another. The second quality is this, knowledge. They're filled with knowledge. Now, what this doesn't mean is this. I got a liberal arts degree from a college, so I have a lot of knowledge about a lot of things. That is not what he's talking about. He's not even talking about having a degree in counseling so I have the understanding and the skills to know how to take somebody someplace in a therapeutic sense. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about knowledge of the Word of God. The life-changing, powerful Word of God. And this is somebody that is filled and controlled with the knowledge of God's word. We just learned in Colossians 3.15, we reviewed it, we saw it a few weeks ago, 
that when a person is filled with the Word of God and it's dwelling inside of you in such a way that it's changing your life, then it shapes and gives direction to the admonishment and the teaching that we give to others. It flows out of a knowledge of God's Word. Admonishment is built on the foundation that I'm going to bring to somebody counsel and advice that is consistent with this book. Not my best ideas and not the latest theories in the world, but what God says. And you know what? God's word is eternally relevant. (laughs) There is nothing more relevant than God's word. It has been relevant since the first day of creation. It'll be relevant into eternity. And we bring to people the most relevant, powerful message that is possible, and it comes from this book. Now, if you know this book, it's not a rule book. It's not a guideline with steps on how to live a better life. It's a book about Jesus. It's a book about man who by his own sin has destroyed his own life. And he's been running his own life his own way. And there's an emptiness and there's a lostness and there's a darkness to their life. And they're wandering around this world. And what God did is he sent his son, Jesus, who is fully God and became fully man. And he lived a perfect life on this earth to prove that he is the only holy one who is qualified to go to the cross and for my sins and your sins to be placed upon him so that as my substitute, taking my place for what I deserved at the cross, Jesus took my sin, and he died for me. And the Bible says, when I put my faith in what Jesus did for me at that moment, I become a brand new creature in Jesus. But it doesn't stop there with just a ticket to ride to heaven. Because what happens is, is the moment we put our trust in Jesus, our old heart that didn't understand the things of God, didn't want to go the ways of God, uh, could have been very religious and moral, or could have been very deviated and perverted. It doesn't matter. That heart that was not responsive to the way that God says life is in this word through Jesus Christ, he took that heart out and he put within us a brand new heart. And inside that brand new heart, he put his Holy Spirit to cause us to walk in his ways and to be careful to walk in his ways. And so how do we live now? Galatians chapter two, verse 20 says this, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and died for me. The context of that, no longer under the law, I died with Jesus and now Jesus is my life. So how how do we live as Christians? Guys, we live depending upon the one who lives in us. We no longer live by the laws in the Old Testament that God gave to Israel. We now live in dependence upon Jesus and the teachings of Jesus we learn about in the New Testament. That's how our life is shaped. And so when I come to somebody and admonish them, it's that foundation that I'm walking with as I come to somebody. I'm coming to them with the story of God in the Bible where Jesus is is the, the Academy Award winner of the story, so to say. And I help people see their life in the context of Jesus and his word and his ways and depending upon him to live out his life. That's what it means to be filled with knowledge. Not just have a Bible verse I can quote somebody and get somebody in the corner like a club that I beat them into the corner and they have to submit but as somebody that understands the person that this book is writing about and telling us about and telling us that our hope is in Jesus. See, the word of God is life-changing and it's powerful. Hebrews chapter four says this, the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged, any two-edged sword. Guys, God's word, this book, in the hands of the Holy Spirit, when it gets inside my life, it's alive, it's living, it's active, it's gonna be working me, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to pierce as far as the division 
of my soul and my spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and motivations of my heart. Jeremiah 23, 9 says, the word of God is like a fire. Guys, all you have to do is look on the news and look at some of these fires out west. It devours everything in its way. And guess what the word of God does? Like a fire, it devours the stuff of the world. It devours the stuff of the flesh. It devours the stuff of Satan that's in our life like a fire. And then he says in Jeremiah 23, 9, this word is like a hammer that shatters a rock. You got strongholds in your life. You're saying, man, I don't know how to get rid of these things. I don't know how to do it. Guess what? God's word is like a sledgehammer coming down and shattering those things in pieces. You go on and the scripture says in Romans 12, the word of God transforms us that means it changes me at the core of my being. From the innermost being, something inside of me changes. And as God's word gets in me, it's alive and active and working deep down, it, it literally changes the person that I am. Romans 15 says the word of God gives encouragement and hope. You're going through a depression? You're discouraged about your circumstances? Guess what? It's in this book. We'll find the, the courage to continue and the hope. Psalm says that this book causes that soul that is flat and dry to rejoice, to be restored, and revived in the Lord. Psalm also says for, that this book is able to make someone wise. That's the skill of living. That's what wisdom is. How do you live life skillfully? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You want to live life skillfully, you need to understand that's by trusting in God himself. And this book gives wisdom. It gives light in the dark. It says, you know what? I don't know what to do. I love what Psalm says. God causes a light to arise in the darkness for the upright. God will bring a light through his word where we say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what's going on. His word will give us light. The scripture says in Psalms that his word will give us understanding. We say, I just don't get it. I don't get why they act that way. I don't know why I act that way. I don't get why the world's like this. I don't get, you know what the scripture says? It'll give you understanding, so now I get it. You go on and you see in the book of John that the word of God is able to sanctify us. That means to deliver us from the present power of sin in my life. It means these things that are enslaving me in my life. The word of God is able to help deliver me from them. He says in this book, this, these words make me clean. They wash off the filth of the world, the devil and the flesh to get upon my soul. Romans 15 says this book produces faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And you say, man, I don't have faith. And I, 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 I just don't, you know what? As the word of God comes and enters into our life in a life-giving way, faith grows up within us. Jesus said, it sustains us day by day. Man doesn't live just by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Our physical life is sustained by physical food. Guys, our spiritual life is sustained by spiritual food. We need spiritual food as regularly as we need the physical food. We live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Peter says, long for this word like a baby longs for that pure milk by which you may grow. Guys, we grow spiritually. We begin to mature Less and less of me and more and more of Jesus is reflected in my life as I get in this book. It's those that are full of knowledge. Those that are full of this life-changing book and story of Jesus, which we're a part of the story of because he came to deliver and save us and he's coming again someday to take us back again so we'll be with him forever. Those are the ones who can admonish. Now, turn to 2 Timothy for a second, 3, 16, and 17. And by the way, 
even after explaining all that, I'm still convinced that Moraine Valley Church is filled with all kinds of people that can do this. Because there's all kinds of people here who take God's word very seriously. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, interesting uh, passage because he's talking about the difficult times that will come and he talks about a couple, a couple of moral compasses that you have in the midst of it. One of the compasses was Paul himself, who Timothy was able to watch his life and learn from him all kinds of things. But then he talks about the Word of God. And he says this in verse 16. And all Scripture is inspired by God. That mean, basically means it came from God. God breathed. It came right out of God's own heart. All scripture is right from God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. You know what it means is this. This book is profitable for us because it comes from God. It's God's words. It's not the world's or my best ideas. These are God's ideas. This is God's word. First thing is it's profitable to teach me how to walk with God in this world. And so as I'm walking along, the Word of God is profitable to teach me. But guess what? Sometimes I get off track and I start going over here because I'm following my own desires or the wisdom of the world. Guess what? The Word of God is able to reproof. Hey, you're going the wrong way. Pat, stop that. That's not the way to live. That's dangerous. Don't go there. So then he says, the next thing the Word of God is able to do, it's able to correct me. It's able to turn my direction to teach me how to get back off that path that I was walking on. And so as God's Word taught me how to walk with God, God's Word convicted me when I got off the path, God's Word teaches me how to get back on the path. And then he says, it's profitable for training in righteousness. Guess what? This book teaches me how to stay on the path and train me so the next time that temptation comes or that pull, I don't get sucked in. But God has trained me how to continue to walk on his path. This is what God's word is powerful for. This is what it's profitable for. And then he says this in the next verse. So that the man of God, the woman of God, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Guys, this book will equip us for everything God's calling us to do, including admonishing one another with his word. And you know what? God's word in the hands of God's people by God's grace, can make a big impact upon somebody's life. Guys, as we, as a gift from God that he puts his word in our hands as we depend upon the spirit and we bring the word of God to others, God's going to change lives. People are going to be saved. Believers are going to be corrected or trained or taught or warned. You know, just recently, um, story, our good brother, Den Georgeopoulos, was in Payless Hospital for a triple bypass. Den, it's good to see you with us today, brother. We love you, one of our elders. And uh, while Den was in there being cared for, uh, one of his nurses, uh, one of the nurses that was there caring for him was named Katie. And Katie was ministering to Den, and in this process, um, Den began to ask questions about Katie's relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you got to remember, this is a guy who's facing triple bypass, like, in the next day or two. In fact, he just found out, you know, he thought everything was fine. When they did the test on Friday, go, whoa, man, I'm with, within inches of being with Jesus. And so here he is facing surgery a couple days and his nurse Katie is ministering to him and then starts asking her questions about her relationship with Jesus. In that process, Katie trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. Amen. 
Now, what I like here is Den didn't say, hey, Katie, you know what? You really need to come to our church so you can learn about God. Den didn't say, let me call one of our pastors to come and talk to you. What Den said, let me tell you about Jesus. Because Den's full of goodness and he's full of the knowledge of God's word. Katie communicated to Den afterwards, I understand, to the fact that I believe I was meant to meet you. Because I really wanted to know God and I was searching for God but didn't know how to find him. And you taught me how to know Jesus. And she trusted Jesus and she said that was one of the most wonder that, that was the most wonderful day in my life and made a comment to the fact of just couldn't believe how much you care about her when you're in the face of a very serious surgery for your own life. Guys, we're equipped. And by the way, Katie happens to be here this morning. Katie, would you stand up? Can we give you a hand? Good to have you with us. A brand new sister in Jesus because guess what? Because one of the people, not one of the pastors, said, man, I can tell you about Jesus because he's full of goodness and full of knowledge of God's word and able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I was praying this morning with the two brothers that I normally pray with about the service, God reminded me that each one of them at one time had admonished me in my life. One of them was after a funeral. And I remember speaking to uh, this woman who had lost her husband by cancer. And I remember just really encouraging her, you gotta hang on to Jesus in these days. You just, just hang on to Jesus. And my good brother, Don, came to me. And Don, Don had lost his wife years earlier. He said, Pat, and he was so kind. <laughs> he said, Pat, you know what, brother? I know you haven't been there, you don't get it. People can't hang on to Jesus at that time. They need to understand that Jesus is hanging on to them. I said, wow. <laughs> Never again did I tell some poor person in the midst of a difficult time like that, just hang on to Jesus, because the good news is Jesus is hanging on to you when you can't hang on to him. My other one was my good brother Dave. Came to me after a meeting once. Those who know Dave, I mean, he was gentle, and that was, God was just, Dave has really grown, because he's got those kind of gifts, and he really has got a beautiful spirit with the gift to be able to admonish somebody in a beautiful way. And he said, Pat, you know what? I sense you got some anger in your heart towards somebody. No way! You gotta be kidding, man. I just blasted him for the next five minutes about why I'm not angry. And I'll tell you what, that opened up something inside of me like a volcano of anger came out of me. It took me about 13 hours until finally about three in the morning, I said, you know, God, I think Dave's right. I think I'm angry. It took God allowing that anger to come out as Dave kind of Joe lovingly and gently poked it with just the question, admonishing, saying, hey, Pat, you know, I think something's wrong here with your spirit. And God used that to clean me up some anger that was deep within my heart. Guys, here's the reality. I am convinced. I am convinced that Moraine Valley Church, that we have a whole bunch of people here that are full of goodness and full of the knowledge of the Word of God and are able to admonish one another. And when we do that, we will be better together. It's really true. It's not, just a, it's not just a theme for a series. It's not just a slogan. We really are better together when we get into one another's lives and minister to one another in the various ways we talked about in this series. And may God, by his grace, make Moraine Valley a church that even to a greater degree, we're ministering to one another the positive truth that says, hey, this is how you walk but also that time that says the admonishment says, hey, bro, hey, sis, not quite sure you understand what you're doing here. And I don't think you see the consequences and the danger 
and the ramifications of what you're in. Satan and sin want to destroy you. Jesus wants to free you, and his way really is the best way. Guys, may we be a better church because we minister to one another. Lord, I, I just thank you for this series. I thank you so much that you really ministered to me in this, God. Thank you, ministered to me through Craig and Mike and Gary. God, you ministered to me as I just studied these passages. And Father, I want to thank you that you've impressed upon me. While Jesus is the greatest gift that mankind will ever know, Lord, one of the, maybe the second best gift that mankind knows is other believers in Jesus. Loving them with God's word, not like a club beating them in the corner, but like a surgeon with a gentle hand skillfully helping them see their sin, remove them from their sin, and get back on the path with you. So Lord, I just thank you so much for this church. I thank you for these people. I thank you for the ones you've sent in my life that have spoken to me and have said, Pat, that's not right in the way you have made me better, Lord, and have kept me because of those many gifts. Lord, might we be people who do that for one another? And God, I pray that you give us the grace to receive it from one another. It's in Jesus' name I pray.